Hi, we're Martha, Stephen, and Mark. And this is Code Comment, where the Nice Games Club game devs inspect the code, assets, and design of an indie game in development. In this episode, we take a world tour of Metro Nexus, Mark's globe-spanning, transit-themed multiplayer battle game. So let's start. Uh, so what we got a brief glimpse of before we went to the menu is my uh, uh, attract mode. Yeah. <laughs> a little video in there. <laughs> For uh, when it runs for too long, and we had it running for too long. Uh, so here we are at my uh, transit theme menu. Uh, we're just gonna play a match. Everybody dial in, throw in the button, choose your team. Yes. Probably all be, we can be on the same team, but, but that wants, doesn't seem yeah. like any fun, right? Africa. And then, yep. And then uh, we have the options here, but this is a demo build, so there's no stage or style select. Let's turn items on. We've played before. Yeah. And we'll go ahead. This is loading screen is pretty new. Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I saw a frame counter in the corner because um uh, not quite certain. But it's been running at 60 for a good while in the development here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so you can see where these little cars, they're yes. weird because every level has a different style. Ow. And when we hit each other, we lose a hit point. Um, and you can also uh, pick up uh, energy and aim it. Let's see, I'm the purple guy here, and fire. And try to take out the other players. Yes. Oh, oh dang it. <laughs> I'm not great at controlling the character. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, it's not, a, it's, I mean, it's fairly simple platforming mechanics, but the, you, when you charge your weapon, you hold down the, the, a trigger, and then you let go to fire. Um, Oh. Wow, we did that in the air. <laughs> yeah. My favorite is watching people uh, run into each other because it's kind of unavoidable. Because in this game, you can't stop. You've noticed we're always moving. Um, and that's by design. It's sort of an endless runner mechanic in that sense. I died. You're dead. <laughs> oh, the mines go off after time now. Uh, that yes. Uh, that's been around for a while. It's basically okay. so you can't fill the, the place with mines. Yeah, that makes sense. They also eat memory, so it's best, best not to let players have an infinite number of them. Yeah. Well, must. So these different icons here give you different items. So the battery that we both have uh, gives you a full charge immediately, so you don't have to wait to charge your ah. shot. And, um... Dang, that sent me back so far when yeah. you hit me. What do we got here? We each got two hit points. Uh, so this one I'm just picking up, the EMP. So I'm going to find an orange section of the map. And I'm gonna charge this guy up, I mean, and let it loose, and then it deletes it. all your tiles. I mean, alternatively, you could have found a purple side of the map. I could have, but I'm purple, so... <laughs> yeah. Oh, dang it, I fell. Oh, dang it, I fell like... Oh, I kind of just cleared everything now. <laughs> dang it! Oh, wait, okay. Yeah. Ah, I'm winning now. So, nope, never mind. I'm close to winning. Are you? So if I run into you... Yes, you can kamikaze your way to a win in this game. That's what I'm doing! Yeah, that didn't. Uh, <laughs> oh, nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got extra life. Give it to me. <laughs> this is not how I normally play this game. Yeah, normally you go for the co op ending. Yes. Uh, well, go ahead and take me out if you like. Okay. I just happen to be winning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got time. <laughs> you do. Let's try. You have a couple seconds after you are the last person standing. Ah, I don't know who to get it. And it looks like you, according to the stats here, you you got me. Ah, <sighs> okay. By a couple points there. Thanks. Uh, so you can see the chart here at the end. This is the. Uh, I put this in there because I love charts and graphs and numbers. And I was like, I don't care what any play tester says. I'm, I'm leaving it in. It's so important. It's so cool. It's before, and everybody loves it. Like yeah. it's people's favorite thing about the game. So that's been very gratifying. Uh, but you can see on the chart here, it's uh, 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 tiles over time on the top there. And you can see right there in the middle, uh, Steven, you were way ahead of us. Mm. Uh, and then uh, something got you good uh, where you dropped a, a huge I got, amount. That was when you hit me with that one. Oh, yeah? Big one, I think. <laughs> uh, yes, because when you get hit, you also uh, let out a little extra static bubble that deletes all your tiles in the area. Uh, so you do keep track of your points, but also your lives. You can see on the bottom chart there. Oh, we waited too long. Now it's the attract mode. <laughs> 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 okay, let's just go and do one more match, sure. and then you guys can do a co-op yeah. uh, mode. Co-op. We'll be raspberry. All right. Blue raspberry. That's right. Uh, the colors are basically things you'd find in your grocer's freezer. That's the that's the naming for the colors. <laughs> uh, so you can see the art style here is different. This is my Game Boy inspired uh, level. It takes place on the moon, which is where the Game Boy was originally created. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I feel like you guys should ask me questions so that I can distract you and win. Ah, yes. Well then, <laughs> well, wait, no. <laughs> well, you're focusing on what to say. Uh, uh, I, we'll, we'll get into it eventually when we when we get into the code of it. But That's I want to know. True. I want to know um, about like how the how you do the art and stuff because this is the first uh, game that we've done a code comment on that is not made in Unity. That's right. <laughs> Um, you have some level of pride about that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so there's, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of differences. Oh, nice shot. Dang it, I can't even get up. Oh, fine, I won't get up. Uh, oh, and I, I also, uh, I know that, like, the art for this game is done by different people, correct? Yes. Uh, most of it currently is stuff I worked on, but I built a template system to work with other artists, and there's a couple stages in the game that are designed by other people. Uh, which has been really draw. Oh, we did it! So the other thing in this game is, while we were busy trying to jockey for position, we were not paying attention to stealing each other's tiles. <laughs> and we ended up getting all that white line at the top. That's our total team score. Because the secret in this game is that, in fact, it is not a competitive game. You're meant to play together. And these charts are tracking your performance like it's a job uh, uh, evaluation. Um, of course, that's not as fun. It's not. It's not the principal way to play the game. But it's this sort of overarching kind of like um, uh, thing for you to discover that the game encourages you. It actually gives you stats what, based on those things. What is the lightning bolt? The percent sign and the timer. Okay, so the lightning bolt. And why bolt is there, there a zero in the in uh, the box? Oh, okay. So the uh, on the right side there, those those three numbers and those three boxes, the one forty five and one forty five. That's the amount of power. Uh, so the the tiles represent powering the the track. And so that's uh, how many over how many there are in the level. Uh, and that's collective. So that's almost all of us. On the, on the left, or, or, um, above at the top, where each of our color-coded scores are, that's our individual scores. Now, if you're playing um, the game with a teammate where you're both the same color, you will share um, uh, uh, your score. Um, but you'll get, your, you'll, you'll get uh, in the charts, but you'll get an individual card that tells you how you did it visually. The percentage is the efficiency score. In the game, uh, this is one of the co-op-y kind of things that sort of gears you towards it. When you're paying competitively, as we were, you can see you have a 9% efficiency. And it's a pretty simple calculation. It's um, based on uh, how many tiles you've uh, collected by, by charging uh, over how many tiles you've actually driven over. So if you drive over the same thing twice, um, and when you drive over a tile, uh, it, it charges it with your color. You don't have to do anything special for that. You can see as we were, as we were going across the stage, it was filling in with our colors. But if you double back, then that's not as efficient. So you, your efficiency drops. Also, when you start removing tiles by charging your weapon, uh, that also makes the efficiency go down. So the best way to be efficient in this game is to, as a team, get a pattern for t touching all the tiles only once. And then you get 100% efficiency. But because there's a little bit of a sort of a satire involved here, it's, it's fairly impossible to get 100%. You're lucky if you get over 65% uh, if you're very good. I mean... And doing it as a team is extra difficult. Yeah. Uh, and then that bottom one there is just uh, time in seconds. Um, the little uh, zeros in the orange uh, and the yellow squares, that's supposed to be the, the record, um, but that's not working correctly right now. So uh, I just, see. Ignore, just imagine that was a number that was... Uh, really high on the top and really low on the bottom. Um, <laughs> but again, you only get those high scores if you're playing cooperatively. Um, you, uh, if you, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, end a match by uh, everybody, uh, you know, getting, killing each other, then whatever scores you have will not apply to your uh, high score because you didn't complete the level, basically. Uh, so let's have you guys. I'll step out, and you guys go ahead and be on the same team, or you can be on different teams and play co-op. That's the thing about this game. It really is like, as long as you agree not to shoot each other. Um, and go ahead and see how fast you can uh, uh, fill, the, fill the stage. Oh man, we speed running. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, whoever's player one has to confirm there. There you go. Do it. I noticed you use left facing check marks. I am left handed, so yes. that's what check marks look like to me. And you'll never convince me to change. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a bit of uh, it's almost a dark pattern. It's like anti UX, but like uh, it doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm I'm purposely leaving it in that way. Yeah, I mean I like it. It makes it feel more unique that way. <laughs> uh, and you can see the characters here. They have uh, numbers Fine. over them, uh, which lets you know which player you are because they are the same uh, player. And because each uh, art style is different, I could in fact make like light blue, dark blue for the different uh, characters on a team, mm -hmm. but that would require a uh, extra dimension of uh, player avatar animations. Success. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my way around it. <laughs> uh, so you can see there it took you uh, 34 seconds, which is pretty good for that stage, actually. 
Uh, not quite the record, but you're gonna have to trust me on that because the record keeping isn't working quite right. Uh, <laughs> Can't quite beat zero, no. Yeah. Uh, let's see if you guys can beat this. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's the stage will be different, so it's not gonna be the same. We'll do one more and then we can dig into it, I guess, right? Cool. So here you're on the moon, so you're actually, in this stage, you're, the gravity is really low, so as long as you hold down jump, uh, you can get a lot higher. And that's what, that's what accounts for all that empty space. Ah. Now, when you're in a competitive match, uh, that empty space becomes kind of like a demilitarized zone. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That one's pretty quick. Sweet. Yeah. And there are other... 61% deficient. Not actually, not bad. Good work. <laughs> uh, the game, uh, in, in its final form, will have more data. So you can see um, you have an, your efficiency graph. You can see your efficiency over time on the left there. Mm. And then on the, those three on the right there, that's really for competitive only. Uh, you have your, your kills, your deaths, and your kill-death ratio. <laughs> Uh, so, nice. so a lot of times you will lose a hit point uh, just by running into somebody that is neither a kill nor a death uh, as far as the game is concerned. So it's really just about your attack efficiency. So the idea is that you'll be able to press this button over and over and over again and just get as long as those errors are fixed, you'll just get more and more data. I'm just going to find many, many more ways for you to claim winning because the game, the, the big thing about the game is it doesn't tell you if you won or not. Right. It just says, hey, here's what happened. Yeah. Um, there's natural ways to assume you won. Like, oh, I'm the last person. I must have won. But the game doesn't crown you the winner. Mm -hmm. It just gives you all the data, and then you and your friends on the couch can decide what mattered to you. Right. That's see, that was one of the things that initially I bumped my head against. Yeah. Because like, I was like, I want to know that I won. Uh -huh. But also you now. someone I, to crown you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but also now I just play for a co-op victory, so I know when I've won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's when I get, we get 100%. Uh, all right. Let's get out of here. Oh, wait. It's a demo build, so you can't exit. Ah, right. That's been very useful. That, yeah, <laughs> that's something we need. In, in, actually, yeah. I guess we could turn off things now, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, so here is my IDE. This is not a Unity game. Right. It's made with Adobe Air, um, uh, derisively referred to as Flash, generally. Um, it's ActionScript is the language, uh, and it's the Adobe Air runtime, which is a de desktop runtime uh, that will uh, compile apps to desktop, uh, PC, Mac, Linux, uh -huh. uh, and also uh, mobile, so iOS and Android. So many of the games you've played on your phone probably made in Flash, and you didn't even know it. Do you um, think you might make a mobile version of this game? You know, when I originally developed the game, it was I wanted to make a mobile version. Mm -hmm. um, that was back when my ambitions were a little smaller. It was going to be a sort of single player, and it was going to be um, of far less controls. Now, I think the controls are probably a little too complicated to make that a really good experience. Yeah. Um, I am interested in having like a simple control mode that just requires a stick and a button instead of instead of the uh, the because you can aim your weapon with the right stick. So right. It's a, it is twin stick shooter almost. Um, but I want to make it a mode where you can turn that off so you know people who aren't as interested in a more complicated controller arrangement or they have a simpler controller mm -hmm. um, or want to play on keyboard, for example, um, can can do that. So I'm going to explore some of that. But I yeah. think mobile probably out at this point. Sure. Also, selling a game on mobile is hard, guys. True, it is <laughs> real difficult. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here's the code. I mean, I guess you can ask me how it works. I have many, many files. Um, yeah. I can start with the structure of it. So um, this is kind of, if you're familiar with Unity, um, this doesn't look any, this would not be very familiar with you, but if you're familiar with just making like desktop applications uh, in Java or C Sharp or, um, or, or anything, this structure should be relatively familiar for you. This IDE, it's called Flash Builder. It's an Adobe version of Eclipse. Eclipse is an open source IDE uh, that um, I think Java was where, where it gained popularity, mm -hmm. but it's pretty much any language can use it. Okay. Um, and then this is a version that has some Adobe proprietary plugins. Um, although the Adobe Air runtime is, um, it's not open source, but it's open access. Mm -hmm. So the SDK is free um, and it's, uh, it's explorable. So you can see all of the, the, a lot of the code inside, but some of it's, it's, it's not uh, fully open source. Um, but you don't need to buy anything to compile. Uh, uh, you can do it command line if you want to. So it's, it's actually a fairly open platform. Um, that's cool. Yeah, it's nice, especially because Adobe doesn't, uh, they do still support Air. They release new versions of the runtime every three months. Mm -hmm. um, but like Flash is dying. I mean, it's, uh, you'd say it's yeah. well past dead practically, right? Mm. So Flash on the web is just, I mean, it's been a bad idea for a long time. Mm -hmm. But as a desktop runtime, and one of the reasons why Flash should be dead on the web is because it's this huge, powerful runtime. <laughs> you don't want to run seven of those in your browser. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a uh, application framework, it's really, really good. Okay. It's very powerful. Um, and having spent a lot of time with Unity over the past year and a half, um, it's given me a lot of confidence to say, like, yeah, this uh, this is still a really, really powerful mm -hmm. engine. Um, and here it is. So uh, you start off with your at your application class. So this is where all of it, everything flows from. And the way I do this here is um, because I was originally going to have mobile versions and alternate platform versions. Mm -hmm. I have a class here, Metro Nexus Desktop, and it extends Metro Nexus. And the Metro Nexus is the um, the the core, the sort of main project, but 
each version of the uh, the project, see I have the desktop version open, I don't have okay. any of the other versions open right now in ah, this machine, yeah. but this is where it would be Android, iOS. Oh, sure. Um, and now I'm, I'm thinking of like Android TV, you know, uh, uh, and so, yeah. uh, with, you know, still with the controller set up, um, but also Mac, Linux, um, you could, I, I have different versions of the project, and then each one of them would have a single file here, which is the part of the default package, and it's the, it's the application, and then it references uh, this file, Metro Nexus, which is in here somewhere. <laughs> Does any of this look familiar to you at all, Martha? No? Okay. <laughs> so um, Metro Nexus lives uh, somewhere else. It lives in this source path here, okay. which is all of my shared, all of these files, and there's many, many of them. Uh, these all exist, they're the same for all my platforms. Mm -hmm. So you can see here's Metro Nexus and the default package of this source path. So as far as namespace is concerned, um, this shares a namespace with this one. Oh, okay. Um, and you can see here I have an input thing here under desktop, and I have this keyboard here, whereas the import uh, input package here um, does not have that class because uh, not all platforms need it, or if it does, it's empty. Um, and so I'm able to do multiple platforms without having to have different projects open. Like Unity is very difficult for if you want to do like a Mac build and a Windows build. Actually, that's pretty easy. But if you want to do like a console build or a mobile build, a lot of times you need a lot of different code and you can do like compiler arguments. Yeah. And there's lots of ways to get that going. But to keep it in one project, particularly if like your target platform only supports the Unity runtime up to a certain point, yeah. but you want to use features in others or whatever, mm -hmm. like it can get really complicated really quick with yes. having different words. It's, confirm. it's much simpler here where I just say, go to these different code paths, mm -hmm. right? If I'm, if I'm running the desktop one from the, this package, then use this version of, the, of, of this class, whereas I'm running a different one, use that version of this class. So mm. in, my, in like the Android or whatever, because you know, the keyboards will work on mobile devices, Android in particular, um, this will be a different class and it will just supersede it, right? Um, so a lot of this is really just very strict object-oriented programming stuff. Um, so people who use Unity in its entity component model, it still is object oriented. Uh, you still can use C sharp in, in that way, but the design patterns of it are a lot different. And it took me a long time to unlearn it yeah. because I am not, I'm a self-taught programmer. So I spent a lot of time learning the right way to program through this project, which has been a couple of years. And so Unity has kind of, it set me back almost to, to scratch. Um, and so it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's, it's interesting to go through a lot of this old code because some of it's pretty old now. Yeah. All of those um, VAR calls are making me nervous. All these, oh yes, so this is, <laughs> this is the thing about uh, this language. Uh, uh, ActionScript is um, syntactually very similar to JavaScript, mm -hmm. uh, where you have your, your, your prefixes, <laughs> and instead of declaring a return type, so you wouldn't say like, in this case, the rumble class, you wouldn't say public status rumble, rumble, right? Like yeah. you wouldn't see sharp. Right. You say it's a variable, right? So you say it's a variable. And now the difference is, there's a difference in between a variable and a function, right? Yeah. Where um, uh, variables do not have return types, they're just variables, right? Yep, yep. Functions have return types. Now, at the compiler level, it's not really that different. It just asks you to decide what it is ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it isn't really that much different. Um, the syntax is different, and you end up writing function and var a million times. And it only is, it's only after you work with C-sharp for a long time or Java or other languages that don't require that of you mm -hmm. that you realize how much of a waste of <laughs> time it is to type that a million times. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't bother me so much, but I'm used to it. Well, I, I just... Uh... You can, I mean, you can use var calls in, in C Sharp as well. Yes, but um, there's limited application for that, or limited best practices for that. Yeah, right? it, yeah, and it makes it, it can like obscure what your code means if you yeah. don't like specify what it is. Right, so that's be, in that case, they're untyped variables, yeah. right? And here, uh, ActionScript and TypeScript and other languages that uses syntax, they're mm. based on ECMAScript, mm. which is a standards body that decides the syntax. Um, this is where you decide the type. Okay. So it's it's um, it's again it's just a, moved around a little bit different. So if you actually look at this line, you can fairly quickly see how this would look like in C sharp and mean exactly the same thing. Yeah. I so I mean, one of the things that uh, I learned after spending all this time with ActionScript and learning object oriented program through ActionScript, thinking like, oh, will this, will I be able to learn other languages because ActionScript is Flash and people don't respect that anymore? Every language is like, like this. They're all pretty much the same. They all have a lot of the same features. Um, one of the things that I like about See if I can find an example here of ActionScript, and other languages have this as well. But let's see if I can see one here. Yes, um, in this uh, function here, uh, this is a, a function that launches for the 3D renderer. Okay. Um, my game is uh, rendered in a 3D engine, and this is very similar to how Unity works. 
where everything's on a quad uh, um, uh, in 3D space, and then a texture is applied to it. Yeah. Uh, and that's how it runs really well on a GPU. So uh, it's Flash. It uses vector drawing for menus and stuff, and that's what's really powerful about the Flash engine. But for the game, where you really need to be very performant, um, it basically works just like Unity does uh, in terms of its 3D stuff. In this function, where I call various stuff, my asset managers and stuff, I have a, a local function uh, here, mm. which li lives inside this. So this function's uh, a scope only exists inside this member function. So that's one of the things that very much frustrated me about working with C Sharp is I would have to put this outside here, yeah. even though I only need it once. Yeah. Right? And it, uh, it's more... That's changed a little bit, I think. Yeah. If you, when you get to... You, you can do function calls kind of like that, I think. Yeah. Yes. I don't remember the full syntax. There's a term for it, and I actually don't know what, it's, what the term for it yeah. is, these kind of internal functions. Method? Uh, well, that would be... I mean, you'd call this a method that is a member of the class... And this, I guess, is also a method. It's just, I think it's more, it's like more casually a function because mm -hmm. it doesn't do, like this just doesn't exist outside this space. Yeah. And this is really good because you have load queue, which will then run on complete as a, it's, a, it's an argument. Um, so it's a function that you feed it when, it's, when the load queue um, is fired. And then there's a separate function on progress and that's fired. So rather, I only, these only ever need to exist here. They don't need to exist right, outside right. this space. So that's what's really nice about this. Mm -hmm. um, and that gets to the sort of event system and timers and stuff like that that I've been complaining about to you recently, Stephen. Mm -hmm. That uh, it, it doesn't that uh, the C sharp version that Unity has uh, makes it a little harder for you to do. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well I've like monologued a lot. I, there's so much to say, but like you guys have questions for me, like yes. how this is built, and I can maybe dig around and get some answers for yeah, you. Yeah, I'm really curious about how you uh, do the physics of this game. I remember you saying that like you use an engine, a physics engine similar to Unity's physics engine. Yes, so um, this is built on a, uh, engine is like a weird word in this yeah. case. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's a framework called the Citrus engine, Okay, and that is how I handle states. So here is my level state, and it extends this thing called Metro Nexus Scene, which extends a thing called Starling Scene, there's so many. This is object oriented <laughs> heaven, um, which extends a sprite. So a starling scene is just a sprite uh, that exists as uh, this. This is this class is part of the framework. The, okay. The the, um, the starling framework, um, which is itself a library that exists on top of the air runtime, which lets you use a lot of the familiar Flash API calls, mm -hmm. like a movie clip, uh, all the things for Flash developers who are listening. You know what I'm talking about. For everybody else, it's just an API. <laughs> um, but it uses it lets you use that, but lets you leverage it with that. What I was describing the 3D engine with the quads and the textures and all of that. Okay. Um, and so the scene extends that, and this scene exists. This is not my code here. This is a, a member of the uh, Citrus engine, which has this Starling scene, which is, uh, uh, you can make um, um, scenes of different types. Uh, uh, this one uses the Starling framework. Sure. It, it gets more complicated the more words I say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have a scene, all of my scenes are based on that. Okay. Um, and you, I'm using this code from my library. Mm -hmm. And then my scene, every scene in my game, including the, the, t the main menu, and then the scenes, the metaphor is very similar to how Unity works it, with scenes. Um, when you load a scene, you unload another scene and, yeah. and you do have to do some memory management where you have to like find the objects in the scene and make sure they're all cleared properly. Sure, yeah. Um, unity handles a lot of that for you. And in mm -hmm. fact, you have to explicitly say, don't destroy this. Don't destroy that. Yeah. It's very, it's pretty, uh, uh, draconian and that's a really strength of it for being developers. Um, this has a little bit of that. Um, it's much simpler. Um, but all of my, um, all of my, uh, scenes have these basic things. So they, you know, they initialize the scene, they update. So this is update calls. So this is very familiar to Unity uh, 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 users. Um, it also runs custom code on destroy, which means what happens when the scene is unloaded. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, I have a, like, I call it flash layer. Um, that's a sort of a misnomer, but flash layer is where I can do the vector elements of flash. Okay. Um, which is uh, one of the strengths of the flash platform. Uh, uh, it doesn't, it's not very performant though. Oh. So, but all of my scenes have a flash layer that, that exists on top of it. If I want to put any flash objects in the scene. Mm -hmm. So the uh, main menu has those. Also, the results screen at the end of the game, that has those as well um, because it does not need to be performant. Um, it, can, it can do something and it, it, there's not a lot happening. So yeah. it's, it remains at 60 frames uh, because there's not a lot. It doesn't ask it to do a whole lot. Right, right, right. That makes um, sense. And so when you destroy it, I say I remove it from the stage. I destroy it. I have to do this extra thing because it's an extra thing I've added mm -hmm. to this scene. Yeah. And so an example of one of my scenes is a level. Sure. And is this where the physics comes into play? Yes. So Box2D ah, is the physics engine here. Okay. And That's I, a Unity thing. That is, a, a Unity uses Box2D in its 2D engine. So yeah. when I started getting into Unity, 
and looking at all the components, like the spring joints and all that stuff, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I know all of this. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Box 2D is not, it's a little wonky. Mm. Like if you get into the API level, you almost never touch the Box 2D API um, in Unity directly. Yeah. Um, you mostly just deal with those components. Well, I mean, to be fair, that is part of it. But uh, Box 2D, I think the, the first version of it was made for Flash. Um, but there's also versions of Box 2D for JavaScript and for other, other languages and runtimes. Um, and uh, my engine, the Citrus engine, it gave me two options, Box 2D or NAPE. NAPE is another physics engine. Mm -hmm. And when I started the project, I just picked one. Like, flipped Never. the coin and picked one. I Never. had no... Nothing. I mean, sometimes there are some days when I wish I had picked the other one, but you know, <laughs> well, it ended up working out because now you have more familiarity with it in the Unity. That's exactly well, right. So. Yeah, the, all the little tricky things about Box City um, happen there. So uh, Box City is pretty simple in this case. I just uh, when I uh, initialize. So um, there's a, there's start functions in in Unity for components, mm -hmm. but in a purely object oriented sense. This is called when this object is created, right? A game object is the object that's created. If I'm getting, I'm not maybe a little bit uh, simplifying things, but um, uh, because it's not a component system, everything in a level is all in this one class. Okay. And then everything inside of a level, all the, all the characters, all the objects, all the platforms, they are called into existence by level. So it works oh. like a tree. It works its way down. Okay. So my scene, this is my scene, right? Level yeah. is a scene. Yeah. But then when I create a platform, the platform then calls... The, uh, the tiles, and the mm -hmm. tiles call the animator on that, and mm -hmm. it all flows down, uh, and everything is in charge of disposing and keeping track of its children. Um, oh. Not its siblings or its parent. Sure. That's, huh, okay, that sounds like similarly to how my brother wanted us to code a lot of fingers. Uh-huh. Because, uh, you know, he's, he's, well, he's classically trained. He he's a computer, computer science major, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He graduated with that. He has a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we didn't. I, we tried to do that, but I think we ended up having some redundancies, in, at least in Vengeance's yeah. case, because like, um, we tried to make it so that enemies had the same similar or the same like build as uh, players did. And like a lot of times they don't need a lot of the functionality these players have. So it like ends up being redundant and unnecessary. Yeah. So uh, I have these objects here. Yeah. And they're all they all have uh, different, uh, uh, you know, everything it's. Everything extends everything else. When you're, uh -huh. when you're really working on object-oriented programming, like it saves you so much time to not have to repeat things and yeah. to have everything flow from um, and be examples of. And so again, I have these sort of abstract classes. Uh -huh. Like I never call a Metro Nexus object. I always call the children of uh, in a in a sure. in an object-oriented sense the yeah. children of. of and when and when you extend what. What exactly does that mean? Does that just mean it inherits from it, or it inherits? That's right. Oh, okay. Yep. It's, that's 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 basically what that means. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, the syntax is different in other languages, but the the concept is is pretty familiar to sure. a lot of people. Cool. So here's my object. It, all of my objects has this. Um, I have a couple of uh, booleans, and I have to write out boolean, um, mm -hmm. which is great. I, I I wonder if there's any language that makes you write out integer. Just curious. Just full <laughs> integer. Yeah. Just because, like, I'm a, I my coding style is is verbose. I like to write yeah. everything out. Um, as much as possible. So I have this animation sequence of a type, and it's just called animation sequence. Like I don't, I don't like, don't say an, anim seek or something the way a lot of programmers do to save them a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I I'm familiar with any languages that have you type in integer fully. Do you have any? No. I'm just yeah. thinking like C sharp has bool. Yeah, just and they're called bool. bools. It's a short, but it really is like an an ints, but the, it's booleans and integers. Right, and right. anyway, in ActionScript, you you get. Boolean, mm -hmm. um, mm. you know, and I, so another interesting thing is um, uh, uh, I have numbers instead of floats. Okay. So uh, action script has integers mm -hmm. uh, and numbers mm -hmm. and that's it. Oh, I don't, we don't have doubles, don't have floats, none of that stuff. Uh, precision is actually not as high. Um, you can, uh, there's lots of libraries to get you, act to, but in this basic core package of the language, mm -hmm. um, it's just called a number. And uh, you don't have to write F afterwards, which is nice. Oh, that's convenient, uh, yeah. <laughs> and like other languages, you can implicitly cast between integers and floats, or in this case, number. Mm -hmm. um, so it has a similar, uh, you know, quality of life stuff. Cool. Um, but again, just other little differences that, like, if you're moving from language to language, conceptually, a lot of these things are the same. Sometimes the little things will get you. Yeah. You know, that you just assume is true other places. It oh. took me a long time to just remember to put F after all the floats. Like it just, I didn't see but the compiler requires that because so it avoids amb ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Whereas the air compiler um, deals with that ambiguity. Yeah. And that, I mean, there can be problems, you know, it doesn't, doesn't do it perfectly all the time, but 99.9 .9 many repeating, it does. It <laughs> is the thing you need to do with. Yeah. And some languages have things that are not, and the, the cost is you have to type ver a million times. So it's not like you're saving a, <laughs> a ton of time. <laughs> True. Uh, frankly. But, um, okay. So physics stuff, uh, here's the player. Yes. 
And I have a lot of like you got jump height, acceleration, velocities. Yes, I got all sorts break. of stuff. <laughs> but, oh yes. Uh, so in in the you know um, uh, because you can't stop. Sometimes I do like there's a button that I don't really tell a lot of players because it's not that useful. Frankly, I'm not, I'm still debating what to do with it, but it's works mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. Well, you can actually slow down the car. Oh, and that's okay. like a, it's like a parking brake. It's not like an actual proper brake. Ah. It, so it slows you down. And so, um, uh, but I don't always let you use it. There's some conditions where you're not allowed to. And so I have a lot of, so a lot of this should be familiar to people who've programmed uh, game objects before. I have signals. Now signals are really interesting in that they're different. I don't see a lot of it in Unity development um, where when these things happen, I send a signal which uh, dispatches it. People are familiar with delegates and actions and events yeah. in Unity. Yeah. This is basically like a, a very much a first class implementation of that kind of thing. Um, signals are not part of the air runtime, but there is a, a very popular library that if you're making an app in ActionScript, you're almost certainly going to use a signal system. Um, I use one that is uh, pretty old. Um, the, you can see the namespace there is pretty common, but there are newer ones that people like. Um, otherwise, um, there's also the native event system where you can uh, dispatch events and read events. Um, and that is actually easier to use as well. Um, but it's a little bit more memory intensive. Signals are really nice. Um, I could get into that, but maybe if you're interested, you can just look up that stuff. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that uh, next to your comments, you have under that just like an empty space in comments. Um, sorry, where? Like It says camera target, and then under that line, there's just a commented line. Uh, here? Yeah. Oh, yes. This is just my use case. It's like a, fo- it's like a drop-down folder. So you can see I kind of have, I try to organize my, actually you can see how messy some of these, you know, these comments are. <laughs> They're all fixed. Um, <laughs> but I try to have a, um, like this is a little harder to read as you scan through. Oh, okay. Um, this feels more like, and this is also weird, which does it belong to? I could do that, but then it wastes space. Sure. And so this is just my um, sort of way of saying like, this is a block. Ah, I got you. It's very. It's been very easy, especially as my uh, a lot of my objects have tons of of members, Mm -hmm. Um, and because I don't have components on my on my objects that are more atomized, um, my classes are a little bit bigger than you would that you would generally get from components in Unity. Um, There's a lot more going on. I don't I don't break these things up like you could. You know, break up. Um, you know, a camera a behavior into its own class. Mm-hmm. And if you can still do that here, but like there's not much benefit for me to do that. Um, and you can have a, like a player event system be its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just want to dump it all in, in the same place. Um, yeah, so. Okay. And you can see here this underscore CE. This is a this is a reference to the the Citrus Engine object. Ah, okay. Um, so this has there's some uh, helper functions. There's a a, um, a sound object that lets me just sort of play sound from anywhere. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a it, having this object. It's a it's a referenced object. Um, let's see if I can find it in here somewhere. It probably it's probably in its parent actually. Um, but um, it, it lets you do some things wherever. Mm-hmm. Um, like the thing about object oriented programming is like you each object should only know about itself. But when you're doing game programming, you want to break that rule all the time. Like yeah. globals are everywhere. It's yeah. totally fine. And so having referenced objects that are referenceable, um, uh, Unity does its Git component as a way to just find things that are somewhere mm-hmm. um, or find game object dot find. Mm-hmm. Um, this the this object is is uh, referenced by this class in a similar manner, where it goes searching for the instance of the Citrus engine, okay. and it's a singleton. There's only one of them. So um, yeah, uh, I, I was curious about how like, how you got the the turning to work because I remember uh, in previous versions of Metro Nexus, the turning was uh, different, and it was like it was it was a lot longer. And I, I remember you saying it was like based off of an animation or something. Yes. Yeah, so the turn. So uh, we talked in our previous episode about sequels, and 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 I was saying that Metro Nexus is a spiritual sequel mm-hmm. uh, to a game called uh, City Connection, which uh, is a similar kind of endless runner but looping platform kind of thing. I'm trying yeah. to find this function now. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Um, and so, um, uh, in that game, the turn does take a, a moment, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it's tied to an animation. And um, whereas most platformers, you turn in a frame, right? right. Even if the animation has some, you, you do that. And so, um, uh, in this case, when you are turning, let's see if I can navigate this. Uh, this is a getter and setter. Yeah. So this is the, this is the syntax for um, a getter and setter object. So you would you would treat this like a variable, even though it's called a function. Okay. Um, and and what I one of the things that again threw me for loop for C sharp is that there is a value, uh, yeah. which you can see I'm defining here as an argument, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the word value is a special keyword 
for C sharp. Yeah. So it's always there. Yeah. But because you don't, it's hard, it makes it harder to learn the language because you're not, anyway, I love, mm -hmm. one of the things I like about this is that this is just a function. It's really not any different. It's just got uh, keywords that define it as a getter and setter. Yeah, totally. Um, otherwise it works fairly similar. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that. So uh, let's see, and this just sets that. Let's see, I'm still, I'm, I'm stalling because I'm trying to find <laughs> where this is. Okay, so actually this is very much similar to Unity and I have an update loop, loop here. Okay, yeah. So here's my update loop. Yep. It reads uh, uh, time delta, you'd call it delta time. Um, and uh, so again, um, uh, the difference here is that it's an explicit update function. Uh, if you're familiar with Unity, um, you just have uh, update, no arguments, it, every mono behavior has it. And um, uh, w w this helped me learn this engine a lot mm -hmm. is I could then say, okay, well, where does this come from? Oh, it, it comes from its parent version of update. I can go then look and find that function. Oh, and its parent is super and not, not base. Oh. Right. So d different keywords again. Okay. So then, okay, well then this one has a super as well. This is a physics object. And <laughs> Literally so, called yeah. a physics object. And it's, um, if you're, if you're a web developer, you're familiar with the term, uh, div soup. Uh, Martha, that you know about? that one? Div soup? Yeah. It's where you just have like divs and divs and divs oh, yeah. all the live long day. Um, and it feels really inefficient, but sometimes it is the best way to build something. And so I get, I remind, I'm reminded of that sometimes where I see, uh, like a lot of my objects have a, a, a parented tree that goes back 16 generations wow. of classes. Wow. And that is how you, uh, you design efficient code. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it's how you waste your day, but, <laughs> um, anyway, so in this update loop, um, you can see, I have a lot of commented code because I go back and forth on mm. this. Is, I do a lot of game design in media res kind of, so yeah. it's not, not really a great, uh, also this is, I think older code, but anyway, um, okay, so if we're not turning, we have uh, a couple of things we can do. Um, so I have, if you're familiar with Rewired or Unity's input system, I keep using it at Unity as example, but it's the thing I have to compare it to, and yeah. I, I assume a lot of our listeners and viewers will as well. I think so. This is very similar to looking for, uh, you know, is button down. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, um, in that case, it's is button down, and then there's a, it's an action um, associated with a button that's yeah. tied to an action. Yeah. In my input system, it's slightly different. Um, it is uh, an is doing an action. Mm -hmm. um, multiple buttons can be assigned to an action. It can be totally independent of that. In Rewired, you can remap them on the fly as well. Yeah. Um, but when you learn the API, it doesn't really surface that very quickly. Um, but otherwise, even the syntax is not that different. Mm -hmm. um, well, I like that. Like you're not using. Uh uh, strings, string literals. Yeah. Oh yeah, string literals are the worst. <laughs> you can see these all caps is a convention of um, here. So these are all static constants, which means nothing in the in the these cannot be changed. Oh, so no, no at runtime these are set. Yeah, uh, that you could try to change them, but the read only. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I did learn recently that C sharp has something similar, um, but generally people just use statics and don't change them. Mm. Um, it's not really. It's it's just a, it's a protection kind of thing. Um, but the convention here is to capital uh, like all caps. Uh, become a, a value for string literals. It doesn't matter what goes in here. It literally doesn't, as long as it's different from something else. Because you can say, um, you know, there's a honk option. Uh, I don't think I've implemented it. Aww. <laughs> See, make a noise or something for funsies. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is my. I very much comment my code when I'm not done with it, mm -hmm. so I know what I put it there for. Yeah. Um, but you say, okay, so here's you got, you got your your constants here. You they can both equal the same thing. And then, in fact, they will both equal the same thing. So ah. they really are just strings. Okay. Um, it's just a it's a way for you to get your autocomplete to work. Um, yeah, string literals are the worst. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, okay. So going back to here. All right. So uh, if we're not turning and we're going, so this is just do I turn left or right, basically. Sure. So in this case, string literal, my bad. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I should probably uh, actually this is different from left or right because it's not this is just direction What I need to do is I need to make a direction class that has some constants left and right Yeah, so there's still some places where I need I could do better um, But with only two options is not a ton of problems right. um, Problem. But yeah, you can definitely see and this is definitely true of a lot of projects that have been going on for a long time There are certain parts of it that are really well built and other parts of it are real sloppy <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and you know sometimes I go in and I try to clean things up but other times it is literally a waste of time um, Yeah, and knowing when the difference is kind of tricky. I, I, I saw um a, 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 th a tweet or something from somebody who was quoting a, a previous uh, there was a quote yeah and uh, <laughs> and the quote was like uh, newer developers uh, optimize their code uh, uh, experienced developers don't optimize their code yet they really <laughs> they only optimize it when they need to <laughs> that's pretty good yeah 
Uh, so here's my turn function. Yeah. It, it feeds a, a direction. Yeah. Um, now I could do this like a vector, or like a one negative one or something. Mm -hmm. I just didn't think of it when I built it and haven't needed to change it. Yeah. Um, okay, we set a private. So my syntax here underscores are private variables, private members. Um, all private members in my in my code have underscores. Uh -huh. uh, they don't have to, but that's just my convention. Mm -hmm. um, I have not taken that up in Unity, mostly because the code I see in C Sharp doesn't follow it, and so I'm trying to be a little bit uh, get it. But then sometimes yeah. it's difficult to know the difference between a public and a private while you're using them. Sure. Um, and you can always refactor it at any point. So, mm -hmm. but I've been pretty good here. So you can see turning is a this is a this is that setter that we saw, and um, I think that was that anyway. But it's public because it doesn't have an underscore. On turn is a, a signal, and it uh, on, we dispatch on turn. Mm -hmm. So anything that needs to know about the turning gets a, gets if it's registered uh, as a listener for that signal will be will be informed mm -hmm. that the turn has happened. And again, this is a public signal. Um, let's see. Ease back cameras is a camera function. You can see it's right here. Uh, move key pressed is equals true. Um, yeah. So my timing. I don't know where I put that. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. Yeah, I'm um, sure. <laughs> it's, it is independent of the um, the animation. Okay. The animation ah, okay. Uh, lives on top of it. Sure. Uh, and is is uh, it goes either way. Uh, if they're not if they're not in sync, it will look weird. But yeah. they're not dependent on each other. Ah. Uh, one of the things I've definitely noticed in Unity that is kind of great as an animator. Like I am a I'm a graphic artist by originally. Mm -hmm. So like this is all totally weird mm. uh, that I'm spend more of my time doing this these days. But um, one of the things in Unity is nice is you can tie tons of things to animation data. Yeah. And it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, it's really tempting. It's also <laughs> really dangerous. Yeah, it can be dangerous. Um, but it can be very convenient. Um, I philosophically don't want any of that. I can query my objects for what frame they're on. Mm -hmm. I can give frames titles and stuff, and I can do. In fact, Flash is so good at that. In fact, Flash is where that idea comes from, frankly. Sure. Um, but in this project, um, I uh, uh, ideologically, I wanted to keep that all separate, even though um, I don't intend to change a lot of those things. I just need wanted to decouple that uh, just for my own sanity, so I don't have to look in different types of places. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to look in different places for stuff, but looking in different types of places can drive you crazy. Yeah. Um, so that's that. Um, so I don't know what I, I mean. I could dig around forever, but maybe we move on to the next topic. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we could show some of the art stuff. So I have a couple of examples here on uh, that I moved onto this machine. Um, let's take a look at New York, which was the first style I made. Now in this game, each level you go to is a different world city, and um, in the in the fiction of the game, the the main character in the single player mode um, uh, travels to these cities to fix the rail rail lines. And uh, she's never been out of her hometown before, so she just imagines what these cities are like, but she only has access to the rail system. So she doesn't always have a great view. So she just reimagines it as how she would. And so that's basically my excuse um, to have the, the art style be completely reskinned, the, the, the backgrounds, the, the platforms, the, uh, the characters, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that also, um, I like to think that the iconography of the item boxes, the UI, the, that consistency um, ties the world together in a way that allows this, the levels to be it, it, like as different as can be. Yeah. Um, that's been the hope for a long time. And, and it's been nice to see that people picking up on that, that they feel like, Oh, I like the look of Metro Nexus. I'm like, great. Cause it looks like a lot of things. <laughs> um, well that's, so. yeah, that's good that like you get, we were able to, uh, I was wondering about that. Like, cause there's so many different art styles and things that like, how do you, how do you combine them in a way that makes it feel like a, a uh, world of its own, in like a com a complete world of its own. I do have a couple of rules, okay. and we'll see as we load this up. Is a font that I don't have loaded, but that's okay. Um, yeah, when he gives artists this template, it has a lot of like, this has to be this way, like not to break your creativity, but like to constrain it, sure, so that you can be more like build off of that. Oh, okay, and you can see this is the art template. Now, in a great, people who are familiar with these programs might be uh, surprised to learn that this is actually, this is Animate, which is what, which is Flash. This is the program that you would make Flash things in. I'm using this purely as an art project. So um, in the sense of, um, so this is not, it's a little bit of a misnomer that this is a Flash project. This is actually just the art style. These get exported as bitmaps. Um, into a sprite sheet, um, the same way you would do in a lot of games. Okay. Um, these are actually built in vector drawing because I, I drew them and I'm, I'm a vector artist. So an animate is where I like to do my vector drawing. Mm -hmm. um, but there is so, it's so complicated. Um, you can see all these different uh, gradients. Um, this object has a ton of detail in it. Like you can see even uh -oh. these little like kind of burnished edges here as the, as the fades go. 
it's it's super complicated. Re recreating this vector object at runtime would destroy most computers. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's much more efficient to actually have them. But what's nice is then I can render them at different sizes. I can do uh, um, higher risk textures if I ever need to do another build. But you can see um, for the different players, I have these uh, these color codes that are very specific. Now you can see there's some variation, but it's meant to be very specific. So if we open up another one, and hopefully it won't take as long to load the next one, um, they actually do, they, that is the thing like Martha was saying, the rules that are in place for these styles um, uh, so that that consistency can be in place. Um, okay. So even though the art style will look very different, um, it has the same kind of um, base uh, language of, of color. Um, now that is really challenging when you want to have something that's very different. Um, and the first one we did uh, with the Washington DC level that looks very uh, a vaporwave style, mm -hmm. um, that one's particularly because it has fo f uh, photographic elements. And so getting the colors to look like the Metro Nexus colors, like the actual shades that are for the players, yeah. not just purple or green or whatever, yeah. um, and, as well still being able to have um, an interesting, uh, unique style that sometimes is evocative of its own color schemes can be very challenging. Um, and so um, that is how you know that works. Now you can see this... Um, this red player that is not available to you in multiplayer. This is my, our, my single player character. Uh, red is sort of the theme color of the game itself, but these are our multiplayer characters. And you can see, I give a little extra detail, a little window here that belongs to the main character is the multiplayer players don't have. Uh -huh. um, so a, a little bit of a design thing. So that's also true of um, uh, these guys where you can see um, here we have the Metro Nexus logo. It's so tiny, you're not going to see it. But <laughs> the Metro Nexus logo, because our, it's our hero uh, mm -hmm. uh, who is reestablishing this, this system of the Metro Nexus. And then you have all the multiplayer. They, they work for World Municipal, which is the sort of, the, the, sort of uh, the corporate entity in the game that's sort of like semi-villainous. Um, but turns out they're all just trying their best. They're just not good at their jobs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's always a little bit, that's the part of it. Now, if we take a look inside these objects and see each one of these, I have built this system here oh. for um, now. This is our, our looping uh, scene, right? For the the drive, the idle animation, the drive animation. Now, the, the, because I'm going to be this template goes to other artists. Yeah. Um, this is what they see. So they see that oh, this is just a description. This let, lets me explain things to them in a way, especially if they're not uh, used to animating in this program. Um, one of the things I wanted to do is have animators from different types, like stop motion animators, traditional hand-drawn cell animators. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to understand uh, what I was going for. And so I say, it can be any length. It's a loop, right? This uh, can be fine. You have your ground plane here. So you can see this is the bounds of the object. And I've just determined that this is enough white space for an uh, artist to do things with without wasting a lot of data, hopefully. Um, so you can have stuff underneath there. So you saw in the New York style, you have this sort of like sweep, this sort of like electrostatic sweeper, I guess. Yeah. I'm not really sure what it is. <laughs> but it's sort of, this is the, what collects and, and drives the energy. Uh -huh. um, it exists under the ground plane. Um, you also have, this is the hitbox of the character, right? So then the, the idea was, is to tell the player like, this is the physical object that reacts to collisions. So to give them an idea that like that is kind of when the players collide, how much overlap there will be, um, you know, that you should generally put the sort of the body of the character in here. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have a character that is too sloped. So then you have all this hitbox that's outside of the visual space, yeah. stuff like that. Um, so just some descriptions huh. here. Uh, and I see it's, it should extend a little bit outside. And I try to make this in a way that is, is um, artist friendly yeah. um, and not necessarily programmer friendly. Uh, which isn't to say I'm like looking to dumb it down or anything like that. Um, I think a lot of the people I work with, even the people who are very specialized, uh, tend to um, you know be perfectly able to embody another world briefly, and I, I have a lot of trust in people to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I, this is just to make it easier for them. Sure. Um, and so uh, again, each one of these, and you know the um, the animate has a really great uh, system for hiding layers and for using guide layers and stuff like that. Uh, so here's the uh, it's called the duck animation, but this is what is breaking in the game. Um, it actually changed in design. It was originally going to actually be a duck so you could avoid um, weapons fire. Oh. But um, it changed into being something that just sort of slows you down a little bit. Um, but visually, it's still represented by kind of a bearing down kind of ducking motion. But you can see the hitbox remains the same um, because I frankly didn't want to do, worry about the design implications. Sure. So at the same time, this is also telling, well, they move slower and they can, you know, uh, actually this is probably outdated text. But... <laughs> Uh, creatively lowering the suspension, putting it for, you know, like really just telling anybody they can do what they want with it. Um, huh. 
And so I think one of my favorite pieces of animation, now um, I can show you a little bit of the template too for, or for how the animation works, but um, this is the turn animation. And you can see my timeline here. Doesn't look like there's a lot going on, but uh, inside, uh, the thing about uh, uh, flash animation is just nested objects. Okay. So you see this animation. This is all frame oh. by frame. Um, uh, cool. And you can see in the gradients change, this was way more work than it needed to be. Frame <laughs> like. um, but you can see some of them are tweens, mm -hmm. others are frame by frame. Mm -hmm. And these all, a lot of these have sub objects as well. So the objects are independently animated. Oh. Um, and you can see this arm extends inside. There's a masking layer yeah. that is not being rendered right now. Oh. Um, but then that object, that brief thing, you can see here is bound into it's I'm, I'm using uh, I'm, I'm tilting the whole animation okay so it tilts up yeah and then here now I'm playing it in reverse and then you can see here I have these frame by oh, frames sure. to get it just right and you can see the end frame is exactly the opposite of the start frame so that's the rules I say here it is a fixed length as the turn begins just describes what happens in the game uh, watch this. so I have sample layers for in the, the blank templates um, and it says it needs to be a perfect mirror, which means this bound needs to be opposite. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a constraint that I put into it. I can certainly have done it other ways by moving the game object in the code, but then mm -hmm. the animators wouldn't be able to visualize it. Sure. Um, so that's uh, for that. But you can see I'm particularly proud of the the way I've uh, sort of maximized the use of of uh, this animation tool to do this sort of layered animation with this, you know, a little bit more efficiently yeah. efficiently than than you would otherwise. Are there uh any, or are there artists that you're uh looking to work with in the future that you haven't yet? Like na like people I can name? Yeah. <laughs> and, and pressure? Um, uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, this project started, bef like this project and this concept, mm -hmm. and in fact, the first version of this template file, um, I built before I met any of you lovely Minneapolis game dev people. And so th the world I come from, the, the film and, and, uh, and television and video production and traditional animation world, yeah. these are the people I wanted to bring in. And sure. I still have, the thing about it is, as this is an excuse I've had for a long time, which is like, I don't want to bring people in to do their levels until everything's ready for them. Okay. And I've been saying that kind of for years. Mm -hmm. And so there's only a couple in there right now that are done by other people other than me. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to keep it that way until I'm perfectly ready, which is why Martha, I don't put a lot of pressure on you. Uh, <laughs> when, when I conscripted you to do a level in the game, Martha is going to make our Honolulu stage. Ooh. It's, it's like the concept art she did for is really cool. <laughs> um, and she keeps from time to time. She'll be like, Oh, I haven't gotten around to working on that. And like, it's really, it's fine because like I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make a push at some point and where not development will be done, but I'll be able to devote a bunch of time to like corralling a lot of people, sending a ton of emails, answering questions, making sure files go back and yeah, forth, yeah. testing different things. Gotcha. Um, but now that I'm here in this lovely game dev community, which is filled with the most amazing visual artists, mm -hmm. like it's incredible. Um, I would uh, love to work with a lot of them. So folks, if you uh, are in the community or if you're not, if you're just uh, watching this episode, Drop me a line if you want to make some stuff for this game because yeah. um, the idea right now the game uh, will support up to 30 styles and there's eight right now that are done. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's plenty of room uh, for people to contribute. Um, so that's, a, that's about as much of a call as I can put out. I don't have anyone specific <laughs> I want to uh, embarrass by uh, uh, naming them now. Okay. Um, I might have a couple people in mind though. <laughs> cool. I noticed there are like train stops and Oh yes. Stuff. So you can see down here this is the remnants of the single player game. Oh. Um, you can see these. This is then the New York style. Uh -huh. uh, it, you, know, it, you can sort of see this sort of similar thing. And you can see that uh, very 1920s. Um, the game, uh, the single player game is designed. You can see the, these different layers. Mm -hmm. The trains would emerge from these stops. In fact, what I can do is, uh, let's see if this works. Um, I, this, if you play this movie, like this, this timeline, okay. it will actually play an, a hand animated example scene of all your assets. Oh. Um, it sometimes crashes ah. when you do it. Well. Um, so we'll just let that see if it goes for a while. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, so we're not going to count on that. And there Yay. we go. And it's all gone. Yay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here is the uh, example scene and you can see this background. This is an old background. It's just a template. It's not really meant to be in the game. Um, and you can see, I have this timeline here. Mm -hmm. which is just a, just an animated timeline. This is not part of the game at all, but what it does is it takes the assets that the artist has created and just does a little bit of a sequence of them. So oh. you can see all the different tiles, the different uh, artists, the, or the different um, 
different art pieces, the, the graphics. Oh, okay. it's, it's not game accurate. You know, yeah. the flashing is going around. But there you see the train going through. Yeah, So th see. this was how the, 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 the initial concept for the single player game, you can see that it blinks yellow and a train is about to arrive. Um, mm. Dealing with collisions here, like how, what happens if, it, if a train comes out at this moment. There's a lot of questions I never answered because I moved on to different elements of the game. Yeah. But originally the idea would be that you would have these, uh, these entrances where the train is exiting from. And then you would have to guide the train to its exit that would be positioned somewhere else in the level um, you, by blocking things that were in its way or getting rid of things in its way, okay. uh, charging the track so the train could go faster. Mm -hmm. And then once it gets to there, then it's, the train has now reached its destination. And I was going to keep track of the metrics where um, you would be scored on how well the trains are running. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, you, can, you, know, you can go for high points, but if you're not keeping track of the trains, uh, none of those systems has got built. Yeah. And that is why there's no other versions of the train. Um, but this, uh, this initial remnant uh, remains. It looks pretty nice, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's nothing in that in the game right now. But you can see this template here, and you can see this is, would not be a very interesting level, in the, especially in the multiplayer version. Yeah. Um, but you can see the different tiles, how they look together, uh, what happens when a player uh, breaks them down um, you know, as they go across. So you can test your own thing, and you can see the player is still charging, so they're not charging those. So mm -hmm. it still uses the game logic, but like it's not perfect to it. The, the little yeah. jump curves aren't the same. It's just supposed to be an example. Yeah, I also have these blank tiles that just are platforms. I don't have to actually implement those in the game yet, but I, I do have them in all the different art styles. Mm -hmm. um, so looking back at some of these is kind of like, I'm sort of I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit um, <laughs> on some of these concepts. Yeah. Um, but it's been really fun to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Martha, I showed this to you some time ago when I you know, initially recruited you. Um, to do this, and you had not worked with Animate at all before, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I worked at on Flash Macromedia Flash oh, back so long, in the long ago. day, yeah, and yeah. I made my own version of Trogdor because I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive. Well, I don't know how familiar you found it, but like a lot of the main things, uh, the main kind of field of it, are the same. Um, but really, I was asking you to. I, this is a template tool. It's just happens to be in there. Um, like, uh, what were the, I'm uh, actually curious, what were the sort of pain points when you were just taking a look at that to start out with? Like, what, what was your impression? Because um, I'm looking to improve it before I really do make that push. Oh, well, I mean, I don't want to get too much into it. <laughs> but uh, I don't remember the old Flash having as many um, nesting things. Uh -huh. And so when I would accidentally get into a nested thing and not realize I was in a nested thing, it got confusing. Also, I think that it might not have had the same philosophy of like if you put a f object over another object, it cuts it out. Yes. Snipper, snipper clips style. Yes. Oh. Uh, uh, animate and uh, uh, flash animate has a destructive editing. So if you can, you draw an object, and then you draw another object. Actually, I should make it a different color. Um, draw another object. I grab it, just cuts it out, oh. and then I have these vectors oh. I can manipulate. So if you if you ever use Anna, if you ever used Illustrator, uh -huh. this is very different. Now I can make this a grouped object, and then it just exists as its own thing. Double click it. Now it's its own, and you can see I have a little bit of a trail here. Mm -hmm. um, and a group is just uh, like a, a fenced-in object, right? Um, or I could make it a uh, symbol. Uh, which then puts it in the library, and then I can make uh, duplicates of it. This is basically a prefab. Yeah. So now I can manipulate them all at once. Oh. Oh, okay. And you can see again, destructive editing. Hmm. Um, now this is just one object. Um, and so it's very quick. Um, people who use Illustrator and spend a ton of time on Bezier curves and uh, objects and grouping and layers. Mm -hmm. um, that is a nightmare I'm not interested in. <laughs> um, I've got a lot, Illustrator is super helpful for a lot of very specific things. But as a sketching drawing tool, um, uh, Animate is really good at being like a drawing tool that is also resolution independent. Whereas Illustrator is very much a lot better for um, constructing illustrations. I, maybe that, that distinction is a little bit too narrow uh, maybe I'm not being clear enough, mm. but um, it de they definitely each have their their uses. But I've always liked to draw in Animate, um, and I like the way it structures things. Now, um, for people who um, are looking at this breadcrumb and like, oh man, I wish Unity had that. Uh, <laughs> Unity is going to have that. Right. Uh, the the nested prefabs that are oh, coming yeah. in 2018.3 is basically exactly this, uh -huh. where you can you can click into something 
and you can still see the world around it mm -hmm. and you can edit it and then all the other instances will be edited. It'll have a, a prefab viewer that is so familiar to me and to other Flash users. Uh, I'm super excited about it. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to make me want to design and build in Unity a lot more. Um, whereas previously, I've been much more comfortable making assets outside of Unity and then bringing them into Unity and then just working with them in code yeah. uh, where I'm also you know, getting more familiar. Um, but having that sort of thing where you can just grab something in the world, double click into it, and then edit it rather than editing it that in just that instance, you edit all instances. Um, or you can go into uh, the library here and you can find an object and you can double click it and it just makes it its own little world, mm. right? Um, so there's two ways to edit in animate. You can edit in, in sort of in context or out of context. Okay. Uh, Flash is going to get like it's exactly what uh, sorry uh, Unity is going to be exactly that system. Okay. So I am just I'm overjoyed. That's cool. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. It feels like the, uh, very much full circle for me. Like <laughs> <laughs> working on this this uh, this air project. And it's funny because again this is in animate, but these assets um, are then exported out as bitmaps and um, JSON files mm -hmm. that then get re read back into an air runtime. So it's it's hard for me to explain how this game is made to people, and I'm glad you're letting me rattle on about it. I hope it's clear enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very fascinating. Yeah, I think that like like yeah, all of this like it, this is all very different for me because like I am basically only experienced in Unity. Yeah. Um, and so seeing a different uh, workflow and different environment and things are is is really interesting mm -hmm. to see like what things are different and what like what things Unity does well and what things it doesn't. Yeah, and it's really hard not to think of something that's not Unity in context of how it's not like not like Unity. <laughs> yeah, you know, all the Unreal people will be like, "We're just just as good." Yeah. It's, there's two big ones, not just Unity. Yeah, and that's true. But yeah. like, I think a lot of indie developers are starting, you know, like and they're looking to a community to to get a leg up on their education. People know Unity, and Unity is easy to learn, it's easy to teach. Right. Um, and also, Unity is best better for two D than Unreal is. And that's true. Three D yeah. is uh, harder to get into. Yeah, and Unity only got good at 2D within the past five years or so, yeah. which is a lifetime in indie games, I mm. guess. Um, but it's really interesting. And you know, it's when you hear about like, oh, Box 2D, it's this other other engine yeah. that Unity uses. Is like that's the got it's a completely different physics system in 3D. Mm. You think it's just the same with without the Z value? Nope, it's yeah. totally completely different. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Anything I missed, guys? Uh, no, I think you covered a lot of it. Yeah. Thanks for showing it to us, Mark. Yeah, well, thanks for letting me show you. <laughs> and I've been working on Widget Satchel uh, for so many months now. Uh, it's been a while since I've been looked in this, so it was nice to look back at it. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back to developing this full time because um, it's still my first love. You know, it's, it's been going on forever. It's one. It's a project that takes forever. Vengeance, you have that for you, and yeah. And I'm 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 anxious to get out in the world. I promised in, in the beginning of this year on on the show that I'd get it out this year. And I'm going to say this here on code comment because not as many people, not many of our listeners check out our code comments, <laughs> shame on them. Uh -huh. But I'm, I think I might be breaking that promise. Oh. <laughs> so, um, but I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with it. I'm still, I'm, I want to, I don't want to rush this out to get it rushed out. I yeah. want to do it well. Yeah. And, uh, and that means kind of powering through and unlearning maybe some of my unity learning so I can get back to this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Code Comment is just one part of our game dev program, Nice Games Club, which, if you're nice, you can subscribe to on YouTube as well as wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and all the other things at Nice Games Club. And if you want to know more about the show or your nice host, you can do that at NiceGames.club. So until we start again, remember to play nice and make nice.